Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. Welcome to the new season of the CG, CG Lecture uh, Series. We promise to have many interesting and informative experts on global issues as uh, speakers this coming season. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for sponsoring the Signature Lecture Series for another year. Thanks also to those joining us on our live webcast. Uh, following this evening's address, we welcome uh, questions from both audiences at the microphones here at CG in the aisles or through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. Many of us would consider ourselves to be familiar with the internet. It connects us to family and friends, provides access to goods and services, entertainment and banking, and regularly feeds our need for information. Tonight our guest speaker will guide us through the less familiar side of the internet, taking a look behind the curtain to understand how this powerful tool is currently governed and how that governance may change in the future. Laura Donardis is an engineer. She's a senior fellow with the Center for International Governance Innovation, and she contributes to the Global and, uh, Security and Research Politics Research Program here uh, uh, at CG, uh, specifically in the area of internet governance. She also serves as the Director of Research for the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is a project led by CG uh, with our partners at Chatham House in London. In addition to our responsibilities at CG, Laura is a professor in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C., an affiliated fellow of the Yale Information Society Project at Yale Law School. Laura's books have been published by Yale University Press and MIT Press, among others, and tonight she'll draw on findings outlined in her most recent book, The Global War for Internet Governance. So please join me now in welcoming tonight's special guest, Laura Donardis. Well, thank you very much for that very nice, in, that nice introduction, Fred. I appreciate it, and it's wonderful to be joining you here at CG. I always love to come up here. It's only an hour flight from Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm just very delighted to be here. Now, uh, as mentioned, my new book is called The Global War for Internet Governance. I want to uh, give a little bit of background into what this book is about and talk about some of the open controversies in internet governance tonight. So I hope that it will be interesting and informative. Now, I'm a scholar who studies the intersection between the technology and the governance, internet architecture and governance. So this is not content, it's not applications, or it's not really anything that you can readily see, but it has to do with the unseen arrangements, sometimes tangible, sometimes highly abstract, beneath content and applications. These are not the things that you see when you're on your iPad watching a Netflix film, the things that are behind the scenes. And the question of who controls that background infrastructure is one of the great questions of our generation, and one inv that involves a constant stream of questions that have never before been asked. I'll just give you one example of a controversy underway right now from the United States where I live. Families of terrorism victims are seeking compensation from Iran, Syria, and North Korea. What does this have to do with internet governance? Among the details of the case, Plaintiff's family members were killed in a Hamas-planned suicide bombing in Jerusalem. Now, the government of Iran was sued because of their support for Hamas, and the group that was suing was ultimately awarded about $100 million in compensation. They've been trying to collect this compensation. Now, what they're trying to do is seek control of the what's called country code top-level domain. Think about a top-level domain as .com, .org, .edu, you're familiar with these, but there are also country code top-level domains, including those controlled by Iran, North Korea, and Syria. What these plaintiffs are doing is they're approaching a, an institution called ICANN. Just remember that, and I'll come back to it later. It stands for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and they're asking this institution to seize the country codes and turn them over to the plaintiffs so that they can run them as compensation. 
So this raises a, a number of questions. Are these country codes property? Is this kind of international controversy appropriately the purview of a civil lawsuit such as this, or should it be decided in international relations? Why does the single institution called ICANN have so much power? And what is at stake, and what should we make of the fact that the US government just decided to announce that it would relinquish, relinquish its unique relationship to this institution and turn it over to a more international governance entity? So a lot of questions emerge, but these are the kinds of questions that I address at the intersection of global politics and technical infrastructure. What I study is the embedded politics of this technology from an interdisciplinary perspective, engineering, social science, and also law. Now from the embedded politics of technology, let's see if this works, uh, there we go. Um, I don't just see things like the surface of street protests, I don't just see online content, but what I see is the embedded politics of the code that simultaneously carries out things like distributed denial of service attacks that disable government servers in Iran. So the things that happen behind the scenes. And I don't just see an esoteric technical standard. I won't get into what it is, but think about a standard open office XML. I study what's behind the widespread protests in India where engineers held candlelight vigils. They were so passionate about this standard. Um, it was the developing world pushing back against corporate power and top-down technical mandates. So there really is quite a lot behind the scenes. And I wrote a book a while back that specifically looks at the politics of the standards, which are the rules that computers use to communicate. It's called protocol politics, and the basic thesis of that work is that protocols are politics by other means. And now I do have this new book that just came out in January called The Global War for Internet Governance. I did select a provocative title for this book, having the word war in there, because I believe that internet governance conflicts truly are, inc and increasingly, are contested spaces in which global political and economic power is unfolding. These, there are control points. There are control points. They mediate civil liberties, like privacy and freedom of expression. They're completely entangled in national security. They affect technology and innovation policy. But internet governance has traditionally been so complicated both technically and also institutionally, that it has been somewhat behind the scenes and to a certain extent out of public view. Much of this work is done by private companies and by these new institutions like the one that I mentioned, ICANN. And much of it, interestingly, has nothing to do with governments. So I titled the first chapter, The Internet Governance Oxymoron, because it's about governance and not necessarily about governments. But there have been a lot of controversies in recent years that have taken this arcane world and brought it into the public consciousness to a greater extent. What have we had recently? Just think about the last five years or so. We had WikiLeaks, you remember that, uh, releasing diplomatic US cables, then WikiLeaks being cut off financially by hackers and uh, by financial intermediaries. Very, very fascinating case. In Washington, D.C., where I live, we had Hillary Clinton's internet freedom speech, which called for private companies to push back against government requests for censorship and surveillance. And then we had, three years later, the cognitive dissonance of the United States government um, enacting serious surveillance and expansive surveillance practices against uh, citizens and those around the world. So uh, in addition to that, I could go on and on about the controversies. We had the internet boycott. Remember when some of our sites were blacked out? Reddit, I love Reddit. It went, uh, had a blackout for a while. These were over something called the Stop Online Piracy Act. We had that. Uh, we've had the massive Egyptian internet outage. We have revelations about the Great Firewall of China. And now we have this open question of how to transition U.S. government oversight over some parts of internet governance to a more international organization, uh, which in the United States by some is being cast as 
Obama's internet surrender. So there's a lot going on in internet governance right now. So at the very same time that we have every aspect of society, our economy, our political structures, our social life completely dependent upon the internet, we also have a loss of trust in institutions of internet governance, in the actual infrastructures, and to a certain extent in private companies as well. Now out of this loss of trust and the increasing importance of the internet has come a call for political attention to internet governance. And out of this void, uh, CG has stepped into it and was instrumental in founding the Global Commission on Internet Governance to ask some of the most pressing questions about internet governance. So I appreciate that leadership very much. Now one point to make is that the internet is already governed. There are control points that require coordination, oftentimes centralized coordination. And many of these coordination control points date back decades, some, uh, some in the early 1970s. So there have been coordination points for quite a long time. Now, um, there's no single system. That's an important point to make. There's no one system of internet governance. The administration of the internet requires layer upon layer of functions. And what I thought I would do tonight is try to go through a few of these layers of internet governance and try to explain what's at stake. So the first issue is called control of critical internet resources. That's just a fancy way of saying names and numbers. Because when we get onto the internet, we write a name such as CNN.com. But what computers read is an associated binary number, which is just a series of zeros and ones that point a computing device to that website. Now the requirement that each of these names be globally unique and that each number be globally unique has necessitated a certain form of governance. It has required centralized control. Someone has to make sure that each name is globally unique and make sure that each number is globally unique. There has been a huge global power struggle over who decides what numbers are doled out, what names are doled out, which ones are allowed. Now, power struggles have reflected tensions between the US and the United Nations, and especially uh, long-standing struggles over control of something called the root zone file. It may not be something that you've heard of, but I'll come back to that in a moment. That's just a file that authoritatively maps <coughs> top-level domains like .com to the associated numbers. There are relatively new institutions that oversee this area. The one that I mentioned before, ICANN, is the most prominent among them. So it's a very, very highly technical area. But what are some of the political issues that unfold in this space? Well, what is at stake in terms of uh, public interest? I'll just mention a few. One, of course, is the issue of adjudicating trademark disputes that arise, like who can have access to what name in cyberspace. The best example I like to give is who should control united.com? Should it be United Van Lines, United Airlines, United Arab Emirates, the Manchester United? And who decides who gets that space in cyberspace? I, well, the lawsuit that I mentioned over Iran's country code top-level domain certainly is an example of the politics and the political decisions that can unfold. And another question is who can authorize new top-level domains? There was a big controversy over the introduction of dot triple X. Should we allow dot sucks, dot republican, dot gay? And who decides what counts as free expression in the online public sphere? For example, when someone tried to propose .gay, the Saudi Arabian government said, wait a minute, we might not want to have that in cyberspace. So who decides what kind of space unfolds? If a company like Amazon, some of you are shopping on Amazon right now for presents probably on devices. If Amazon decides that it wants to apply for .amazon, that makes sense. They own the trademark to that. But what happened is that governments with the Amazon rainforest within their borders said, well, wait a minute, we should probably control .amazon. And the same exact thing happened with .patagonia. So you, there's a company and there's also a region. 
So the whole area uh, is just both complex technically but politically charged. And I like to use those as examples because sometimes we can just assume that it's only a technical decision, but the basic thesis of my work is that the technology is also political. And that certainly is the case with critical internet resources. But it also is with um, internet standard setting. You don't have to worry about what's on the slide. It's just a pretty visual. But I, I want to explain what standards are on the internet. And I want to explain what the political implications of them are. This is a very powerful area of internet governance. Um, internet standards, they're also called internet protocols. These are just the rules or the blueprints that are used when someone's building a computer or building a device. They use these, they adhere to these rules to be sure that when the device is manufactured, it will communicate with other devices that also adhere to those standards. Now, what are some examples of everyday protocols? Wi-Fi. MP3 is a standard for compression of music. Bluetooth, when you see people with a Bluetooth device in their ear. These are everyday standards, and certainly HTTP is important, and a set of standards called TCPIP, which are the basic building blocks of how the internet works. So these are, does anyone know who sets these standards? There are international organizations, most notably one called the World Wide Web Consortium, and the Internet Engineering Task Force. They set these standards and they set the rules for how the internet works. Now, these are, of, of every aspect of internet governance, probably the, the highest technical area, very, very complicated. But I want to give you a few examples about how this is also public policy. <laughs> Best example, encryption standards. The strength of encryption mediates between what law enforcement can do and how much privacy we have. A protocol like BitTorrent, and yes, that's a, sta that's a standard or a protocol for peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. It performs a straightforward technical task, but it's also inextricably linked to piracy. Other standards determine the extent of accessibility for the disabled online, for the hearing impaired and the sight impaired. So standards absolutely are political. Another area is cybersecurity governance, uh, very challenging. Beginning with something called the Morris Worm in 1988, it was the, one of the first instances of a major security disruption on the internet, to more recent, very sophisticated code such as Stuxnet, which was code implanted in Iranian nuclear reactors to disable their nuclear systems. Internet security attacks have becoming are they're becoming far more sophisticated than ever before. Much responsibility rests with the private sector in handling cybersecurity governance. And it also involves uh, public-private institutions, such as these institutions called computer emergency response teams and a host of other institutions. And uh, this is, of, of all the areas, um, perhaps most obviously political, because you know of many cases of hackers like Anonymous using uh, hacking techniques like distributed denial of service attacks that simultaneously attack a government server and take it down. Estonia, the Estonian government was affected to a great extent by outages due to these kinds of attacks. I also like to mention interconnection governance. Uh, this is really the unseen internet. Now everyone in here knows that the internet is not actually a cloud, despite how professors like me draw it on the whiteboard. It's not a cloud. It has a physical infrastructure. It's a network of networks. It's not a single network. And these networks have to conjoin in certain spots. Now, there are buildings that you can go into. And I've been in some of them. They, trust me, they have people working in them. There are Coke machines and vending machines where you can get a Snickers bar. There are buildings that conjoin these different networks together. They're often called internet exchange points. And the decisions that companies make at these exchange points are very powerful decisions because they decide who gets to connect, what traffic is prioritized, and who can economically benefit from the internet. So what if I want to connect to um, a cable provider to your home? And they say, well, you can, but if you want to deliver your movies, you have to pay me a huge amount of money to prioritize the content because I'm competing with their 
connectivity. It's sometimes called a net neutrality-like issue at the center of the Internet. Um, in the U.S., we have a lot of uh, media coverage right now about a decision for ne Netflix to connect directly to a cable company. So this is another area of Internet governance. But it's not about governments. It's about how the private sector decides to connect to each other to in, you know, cumulatively connect to form the global Internet. So I do like to mention that. The most interesting area of all has to do with the policy-making role of the private sector. The governance of the internet involves direct policy formulation by a host of different kinds of private companies. Social media platforms, the kinds of information aggregators like YouTube that store videos or Flickr that store images, reputation systems like Yelp, all kinds of different I call them information intermediaries, which is just a fancy way of saying an application that we can host content on in some way. Now, these uh, often are free services. We use all of these things for free, and we've made a Faustian bargain because we allow them to gather data about us and sell that data and serve online advertising to us. And they are definitely establishing policy in the area of privacy. What kind of ga data can be gathered about me? Um, they certainly make uh, decisions about free speech. Uh, they remove hate speech. They deal with cyberbullying. They have to deal with requests from governments to turn over information about us. And they have to decide how to deal with intellectual property rights, like copyright. So they're definitely um, enforcing and enacting governance. And then finally, Who's seen this slide? You know who you are. Who's gone to a pirated a site with pirated movies and maybe came across this site? The students, all the students in the room have come across this. Um, <clears throat> this is a huge issue. It's the governance area of the intersection between internet architecture and intellectual property rights, so like copyright. Now, this has, um, this has involved things like what it's called traditional online enforcement via notice and takedown. What is that? It's just a fancy way of saying, if someone has a video on YouTube and I own the copyright to that video, I can notify you to YouTube and ask them to take that video down. Well, that has produced some strange results. So we've had situations in which um, a mother put a video of a baby dancing to a Prince song on YouTube, which is a very innocuous and charming act and the copyright holder to that music requested that it be taken down. It produces all kinds of uh, strange circumstances. But there's a new governance um, arrangement where instead of going after individual content, now copyright holders are turning to infrastructure. And so we see things like three strikes rules, where if your teenager at home, your, your, um, your younger teenage brother or sister is downloading video games illegally, you'll get one notice from the internet service provider, then another, and then a third, and then the entire household's internet access can be cut off. So there are huge issues here that are related to free speech, because if the entire household gets cut off, then that will affect everyone's right to access to knowledge, their ability to do commerce, and their right to speak in the digital age. So my, um, what my work does is I, I address all of these different areas. My primary concern is free speech, to be sure, but also economic liberty, so communicative liberty and economic liberty. But what I, I thought I would do next is try to, uh, rather than go into further depth in any of these areas, is to try to explain a couple of themes that cut across all of them. So some themes that I develop in my book. The first one is absolutely that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. The complex institutional and technical scaffolding of internet governance is really behind the scenes and not visible to us in the same way that movies and applications and content is visible. But they nevertheless, I hope I've convinced you, embed a lot of cultural and political tensions. Uh, certainly the control over internet names and numbers uh, and particular concern about the US government's role in controlling these names and numbers is um, politically charged. Internet protocols, I mentioned, are political in their design and in their effects. Even very, very routine technologies, like something called deep packet inspection, where an internet service provider 
opens up the contents of packets as they're sent over the internet and inspects them to determine how to prioritize them. Now that makes sense from an engineering perspective, but the equivalent in the postal service would be a postal service worker opening up an envelope, reading the contents, and then deciding how to route that information. So that's uh, political as well. A second theme that I always develop in my work is that internet governance infrastructures are increasingly <laughs> proxies for things having nothing to do whatsoever with internet governance. This has been a very, very interesting trend. Intellectual property rights enforcement has turned to infrastructure, as I mentioned. Governments who have experienced a loss of control over their information have turned to infrastructure to cut off access. Certainly the best example of that was the massive Egyptian internet outage where the government cut off all internet access and cell phone access. So that was an extreme case of this, but it's happening all over. So the truth is that jo global choke points do exist. And that's, um, that's very important to know. Despite the decentralized physical geography of the internet and the decentralized institutions, there are virtual choke points where control can be exerted. And these are increasingly recognized as control points over a variety of different governance areas. And then the third theme is that internet governance is highly privatized. It's, as I said before, about governance and not necessarily about governments. Let me, for, let me just stop right there and say that, of course, governments perform a lot of policy over the internet, a lot of governance. They regulate computer fraud and abuse. They perform antitrust oversight. They're responding to all manner of internet security threats. They're involved in privacy laws and child protection and you know, developing any, a host of different regional policies about internet policy. So there's a lot there, but most of the governance functions that keep the internet operational are done by the private sector. And before I set out on this research project, I wasn't sure the extent to which that was the case, but after researching for a number of years, it's a highly privatized area. So private corporations are enacting policy not only in carrying out their core functions to keep the internet operational, but also in the sense that they're actors responding to events on a larger stage. They're dealing with requests from governments to turn over information. They're ask, the governments are asking uh, corporations to filter information, to block it, to take down accounts. So it's, this is delegated censorship, it's delegated enforcement, it's delegated um, everything from the government to the private sector. Governments ask search engines to remove links, for example. They approach social media companies to remove content. So this is um, a big trend in that governance is shifting to the private sector, we have these transnational companies doing the work that traditionally has been performed by governments. And that's a really interesting problem and opportunity, but for better or for worse, that is what's happening. Now, what I'd like to do in my remaining time before I open it up for questions and answers is to highlight a few issues, a few future issues where I think that um, that there are some challenges to the future of internet governance and to the future of the internet. Let me highlight a couple of these. One has to do uh, with fragmentation. Now, what does this person have to do with fragmentation? Does anyone know who this is? Right, uh, from Brazil. Now, I, I think the internet is, um, you know, we think of it as a universal platform in general. I was just talking to a few people about, well, you could say that the internet is not really universal now because there are language differences, there are digital divide issues, there are um, systems of filtering and censorship. Uh, if, if you access the internet in Arabic, for example, it looks like quite a different internet than when you access it in English. But in general, the building blocks for technical interoperability and to have a universal internet are present. So at the technical level, we have those building blocks. But there is increasing concern, and this is rightly so, 
that will have internet fragmentation. Instead of having a, a universal internet, maybe we'll move to a fragmented internet where we can't all communicate with each other anymore. Most recently, this has arisen in response to Edward Snowden's disclosures about the expansive NSA surveillance um, of the United States government. So the president of Brazil here, shown here in this picture, decided to convene a summit called Net Mundial in Brazil. It was a global summit on internet governance. Um, to discuss this, to discuss surveillance, it uh, turned out that the meeting discussed something completely different from surveillance, but that was the impetus going into it. Um, reactions to the surveillance as it pertains to the possibility and the question of whether we'll have an in a universal internet have been, some of them have been the following. Let's route around the U.S. to avoid switching traffic through the U.S. and avoid some of the internet exchange points where networks combine in the U.S. Let's create walled off internets that don't go through the U.S. or other Western countries. The Brazilian government actually raised the possibility of wanting U.S. companies to store data about their citizens in Brazil on Brazilian soil. German telecommunication companies have proposed the development of walled off internet, uh, intranets designed to stop NSA surveillance at the borders. European, European Union officials have called for the development of European Union specific cloud services. So will we have a universal internet or will we have nation specific intranets? Now, a, cl a closely related question has to do with, will we have what's called multi-stakeholder internet governance? I was just talking to some folks about, do, do people know what multi-stakeholder means, what the word means? Now, when you know what it means, I want you to explain it to me. Okay, so just email me, denardis at american.edu, and I would really appreciate it. I'm being, I'm, I'm being just a little facetious, but it's the basic idea that there's shared governance and co coordination of the internet by governments, civil society, and private industry. Now, the recent world gathering, I showed you uh, the president of Brazil. Here's a picture of, from Net Mundial, from the Net Mundial meeting. It really ended up discussing the future of this multi-stakeholder governance. And the word is usually bandied about with no explanation whatsoever for what it means. So it's 2014 and it's time to unpack this word multi-stakeholderism and this is something that the Global Commission on Internet Governance is doing. Um, I'd like to, to just provide a few caveats about this term. It's very important that it not be a value in and of itself. So having something be multi-stakeholder is not the value. It, it's we have to think about more salient interests like securing the internet, like preserving free speech, like having stability, like having openness. I would also make the argument, and in the internet governance world, this is a very provocative argument, that maybe we don't want every single area of internet governance to be multi-stakeholder. So are there some areas where you really just want the government to handle it? The answer is yes. There are other areas that are properly the domain of private industry, making private contractual agreements. So it's important to figure out which areas need to be multi-stakeholder and which areas do, do not. Part of the confusion here is that the internet is often viewed as a single thing. Do we view the internet as a single thing? When I draw it like a cloud on the board, it looks like a single thing. It's an icon, a cloud. But that's not at all how it works. And I, I often, when I'm talking to the media, I often get a question such as the following. Well, who do you think should control the internet? Should it be the US government, the United Nations, or Google, for example? Right, like who should control the internet? And that, that question makes absolutely no sense because it implies that there is a set of keys that you can turn over from one organization to another. And um, I, everyone in this room knows there is no set of keys. There are, as I described in my book and also just a little bit tonight, there are layers upon layers upon layers of functions that keep the internet operational. 
Now, if you look at the entire internet governance system as an, more like an ecosystem, then you could say, well, we do have a lot of multi-stakeholder coordination with private industry taking the lead in some areas and governments taking the lead in the others and um, ICANN uh, working on some institutions uh, of internet governance and keeping uh, names and numbers operational. But there are a lot of calls right now because of all the controversies that I mentioned to bring in more government oversight of these areas and a lot of countries around the world, and it's a, you know, certainly as a rational position to take if you're a government, is to bring in multilateral government, governments, governance, where countries, nation states, would take over some of these functions that have been done by ICANN and the uh, private sector. So how that, um, how that unfolds is going to be very interesting. But I want to, I want to zero in on one particular issue. Uh, so we're going to drill way down now. There's an imminent question. The imminent question is what will replace the US government oversight of some functions of this institution ICANN? So they're keeping names and numbers operational. They make a lot of policy decisions. The ICANN involves the involvement of the private sector. It has something called a governmental advisory committee where governments are involved. But some functions that ICANN performs, such as authorization to changes to that root zone file that I described. So authorizing the addition of something like .XXX or the addition of something like .Amazon or the addition of a country code top level domain like .Israel, for example. The US government has the exclusive authority right now to do that. And it has announced, that in particular, the Department of Commerce has announced that it will transition to Again, this word, multi-stakeholder internet governance. So what will that look like? In the US, it's a very controversial development. As I mentioned, uh, both on the left and the right, uh, politicians are saying that this is not good for the stability of the internet and that governments like China and Russia with poor censorship uh, track records will step in. There's a lot of um, hype. There's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of misunderstanding about how the technical functions work. But there's also a very rational concern about the stability of the internet. And I raise this because it's a completely open issue. And the Global Commission on Internet Governance is addressing this in some of its upcoming meetings. And it is a very, very important issue to address to see what it will look like to go from having this unique relationship of the US government in internet governance to going to a more multi-stakeholder internet governance function. Now, finally, I just want to mention one more challenge to the future of internet governance. And it has to do with something that I'm concerned about very much, and that's uh, democracy which is, has always been linked to the possibility of anonymous speech. Does anyone remember this cartoon? So we know your age, the people who laugh. Remember in the early 1990s, there was a New Yorker cartoon depicting this internet surfing dog along with the caption, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, now they know that we're a dog, and they know what we're shopping for, and who we're talking to, and what we're doing online, and where we are, and a lot of behavioral, locational, contextual issues about everything we do online. It did seem like the initial technical affordances of the internet provided the possibility for anonymous speech. That's the case. At a minimum, there was something called traceable anonymity. So we had a certain degree of an expectation for privacy unless law enforcement requested information about us um, from a service provider like America Online or CompuServe or any kind of internet service provider. But at the uh, content and application level, really big shift away from the possibility of anonymity in recent years. Some social media companies and news commentary spaces are requiring individuals to use real name identifications. Um, Facebook is the prime example of that, you know, all for rational and good reasons. At cyber cafes, such as in Brazil and India, there are requirements to put down your ID and have some kind of verification of who you are before you can use the internet. And in those parts of the world, that is a primary mechanism of getting online. <clears throat> 
Chinese authorities have been contemplating a policy to legally prohibit any kind of digital anonymity, even at the content level. So real name registration would be required for internet use. So there are trends away from anonymity on several different fronts. There are these national statutory mandates uh, for real identification. There are the cyber cafe um, real identification requirements. And there's a lot of cultural pressure for real name identification over concerns about the role of anonymity and terrible things that can go online like um, harassment, defamation, and cyberbullying. But apart from these issues that exist at the level of content and applications, what I'd like to warn about is that at the deeper technical infrastructure level, traceable anonymity and technical identifiers are, are much more embedded. What I have my doctoral students do is read the privacy policies of Facebook, Twitter, Google, Snapchat, Apple, all of those things. Because what we do is we agree to use something and we just click OK. And I have to say I do do that because when I want to get online, I don't want to be reading through a 25-page document. So who here has read some of those privacy documents? Just a few people, right? Three or four hands. Now when you go through those, you see that technical identifiers exist at, at very many different levels. At the level of hardware, such as globally unique binary numbers, such as a physical number on an ethernet card, uh, via, logically via an internet protocol address, which is a unique binary number that is assigned to us when we get online. Locational identification where we have Wi-Fi antennas that give our position. We have our cellular service that gives our position. We have global positioning systems that give our position. And these are the things that are gathered. So there are many, many, many different things, and many more than that are described here, including the unique software imprint that is on your computer. Now, the collection, retention, and sharing of data that is gathered linked to this identity infrastructure is at the heart of that Faustian bargain that I mentioned before. And that's that we use software for free. We don't pay for social media or for email or for search engines or anything else online. But the way, it's not that money is not changing hands. Phenomenal amounts of money are changing hands. And it's just not between us and the provider. It's between online advertisers and the intermediaries. So it's really, really big business. Now, separately from this issue, I mentioned that network operators now routinely use that technology called deep packet inspection, which is like the postal service worker opening up packets and viewing it. So those kinds of trends, as well as this deeply entrenched identity infrastructure beneath the layer of content and beneath the layer of applications, makes it quite a challenge to have the possibility for anonymous speech anymore. And so the question of uh, whether what that will do to democracy is a big question of our generation. So I certainly understand and appreciate the law enforcement rationales, the business model rationales, concern about how to deal with cyberbullying, and the ways that these identification systems can help with those things. I understand that an entire industry's profit depends on gathering this data about subscribers. But we do live in a global, networked environment, we're not just in Canada and the US, in which these real name identifiers can sometimes result in a journalist being imprisoned or someone who is protesting uh, being thrown in jail. So it's, um, it's a great way to crack down on dissent around the world and on free expression. The traditional internet, to a certain extent, gave speakers the choice about whether to be anonymous or to use a real identifier. And taking this choice away from individuals and putting it in the hands of gatekeepers, I raise in my book as a major shift in internet governance and freedom of expression. So that's another, um, just another caveat about the future of the internet. One final thing that I will add on to that is that the internet is no longer a communication system. Because more, more things are connected to the internet than people. <laughs> 
So it's communicating, yes, between devices. It's a control system that is uh, connecting devices, like our alarm systems at home, our kitchen appliances, our watches, our running sneakers, our clothing, and drones, and other things. So there are devices connected to the internet, and there's communicating between the devices. So as we move away from the internet as, a pub just, as just a public sphere, and just a space for commerce into the internet as a control system that ties together all the devices in the world, then that is going to exacerbate all of those things that I mentioned about privacy, about interoperability, and about what harm can be done economically from fragmentation. So it's not just um, me being able to download a kitten, a video of a kitten online, and uh, funny videos, um, and surfing through Reddit, as I often do, it's about the ability for commerce to exist, for the global economic trade to exist, and for devices to be connected. So many open questions do exist, and I, I raise a number of those in the last chapter of, of my book. But the truth is that the internet um, is governed. I hope that I convince you that the internet is governed. It's not necessarily a traditional Govern governance the way we normally think about it, but it's distributed governance that involves a combination of governments, private sector, in some cases citizens when you look at the blackouts, and these new very powerful institutions. I only mentioned ICANN, but I could also mention a host of uh, called registries that operate the various top-level domains, registrars who hand out domain names, certificate authorities that are these institutions that certify to your browser when you're online that when you go to buy something on Amazon that it's actually the Amazon site. It's very, very powerful. So lots of security institutions involved in that. So this whole system of institutions, of private industry, and of governments is in a state of constant flux. But we're at an inflection point right now because a lot of the way that the internet is governed has suddenly come into the public consciousness and into the sites of policymakers. And there are many, many different proposals to make changes to that system. And what I like to emphasize is that it's important not to take for granted the stability of the internet. The way that it's been managed up until now and secured up until now has been fairly successful, as well as, as, as I mentioned, technically complicated, institutionally complicated, but it's been fairly successful and we've had a lot of um, economic growth and we've had a lot of growth, you know, three billion people on the internet soon grow to five billion, many of them in emerging markets. So how we make changes to that system will change what our civil liberties are. If you believe that it's only a technical system, then in some cases it doesn't matter. If you believe that it is a system that is both technical but also makes decisions about our civil liberties, then it's something that we should all pay attention to. Internet governance is particularly potent because it involves the technical mediation of our very public sphere. And it involves the privatization of our conditions of freedom within that public sphere. So that's incredibly powerful. So what I hope I've done is provide some insights into the politics of how this all works. I also hope that some of my caveats about fragmentation, about the possibility for anonymous speech, and other kinds of issues of stability have um, piqued your interest about this and provided some food for thought about the relationship between the future of internet governance and uh, the future of our freedoms. There are a lot of global debates underway. I'm very uh, delighted to have the opportunity to serve as the research director for one global initiative, which is called the Global Commission on Internet Governance. It was uh, founded by CG, along with a think tank in London called Chatham House. It was announced at the World Economic Forum earlier this year, and it's being chaired by Sweden's Foreign Minister Carl Bildt. And this uh, global commission has gathered together some of the great minds in internet governance and policy, some people who are involved in technology. And the idea behind it is to come up with a strategic vision for what the future of internet governance should look like. One big uh, corollary component 
is uh, the commissioning of a lot of empirical research so that it's not just people talking about things and giving opinions, um, but also being backed by empirical data about what's at stake in some of these decisions. So these debates are important. And I, I'll just give one final push for why it's important. The stability of the internet really should rank among other kinds of global collective action problems like the, like envi the environment, like human rights, like basic infrastructural systems of energy and finance. These are all things that transcend global borders, but the decisions made affect local economies and individual people. So I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak about these things tonight. Um, because both policy engagement and scholarly engagement and public engagement are in incredibly important considering the issues at stake. I always like to end with a quote from Vinton Cerf, who's often called the father of the internet because he invented the TCP IP protocols. And he says that if we all uh, do not pay attention to what's going on, users worldwide will be at risk of losing the open and free internet that has brought us brought so much to so many. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to fielding some questions and comments both from you and from our internet viewing audience. Thank you. So I think we probably have mics set up on each side, and um, Come on down and don't be shy and tell us how things are. Who would like to ask a question or a comment? And I field, I field questions about any subject too, and I might make up the answer, but history. <laughs> I just got back from Istanbul, the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. What would you like to know about Istanbul? Anything? Yes, here's a question. And please introduce yourselves if you would like. Am I on? Oh, hi. My name is Paul. I live in Kitchener. Um, I have a question about the Internet Engineering Task Force. So my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that it was, membership in that task force is fairly open in the sense that you can, anybody can contribute to any of the, uh, any of the proposed standards. Um, and my other understanding is that it actually got stuff done in the sense that it actually got proposals through and helped uh, define some of these protocols that uh, determine the internet. So if both of those are true, then why did it work so well when so many other sort of institutions that try to come up with things don't get things done so well? Why does the IETF work so well? Or did. Right. Well, for, for anyone who's not familiar with the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, they're the primary standard setting body that sets the core internet standards, TCP, IP, HTTP, a whole a host of them, and they date back, the Internet Engineering Task Force dates back to the beginning of the internet. Vinton Cerf has been involved in that and a lot of other people. Now, what, um, what you're pointing out is that this is a very unique institution in that their, way, their mode of uh, producing standards is one that is very participatory. So let me explain that. Anybody can get involved in the setting of standards. Anyone can view the standard once it's developed. So, so it, it has to be said that standards aren't software or hardware. They're actually more like documents. They're written rules that we can follow to build computers that can interoperate with, with other bodies. So they build these things. They have them archived. They're publicly available archives. You can go online and Google, to use the term, um, internet RFCs, the Re Request for Comment series. And a lot of uh, scholars who are interested in this area can see that that is a very uh, rich historical archive of the history of the internet. But it's very technical. Um, you can go and look there, you know, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of these things. What uh, was pointed out is that anyone can go to the Internet Engineering Task Force meetings and participate in the development of a standard. And anyone can uh, read them once they're online. Anyone can use them. They're, tr they're typically not 
um, encumbered with a lot of intellectual property rights restrictions, and that that openness, it's usually called an open standard, is responsible for the success of the internet. So why has it been so successful? I would say the reason that it has been successful is because of that last thing that I said. It's, it's, it's openness. It's open in the development of the standard and that anyone can get involved. It's open in the um, implementation and that you can access the actual document. And then that results in openness in use in that there are multiple competing products built on that. The philosophy of the Internet Engineering Task Force has been one called, if I'm getting this right, a rough consensus and running code. So it's not a pure vote, but they, in a room there's rough consensus based upon code that works that's built upon the standards. So I think that's why it works. Now I do want to say one caveat, even in an open environment like this, there are barriers to involvement. The barriers come in three or four different forms. One is money. So in order to go to these conferences, you know, these, the people involved are involved in their individual capacities, but they're also, in, they're also um, linked to some kind of a private company who sends them to the conferences. IBM, for example, has hundreds of people that go to various standards conferences. It also takes expertise. So even someone like me with an engineering background, you know, I could only be an expert in a few of the different protocols. You really have to have a lot of technical expertise to be involved in something like that. And then there are also some language barriers because it's done in English. And there are also cultural barriers because of the involvement. So even in a very open organization like that, you could also look at the, um, you know, some of some of the things that could be better to make it more open. So that's about the Internet Engineering Task Force. Final point on that is that there are um, other standard-setting institutions. It's not the only one. Uh, the ITU sets standards that is part of the United Nations. Uh, there's the World Wide Web Consortium that sets standards for the web. There's the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They set Ethernet standards, and so you're familiar with that. So there are many organizations. If someone is interested in that area, um, you know, I actually have a book called Opening Standards, The Global Politics of Interoperability about standard setting. But thank you very much for that question. And how about one over here? Uh, thank you, Laura. My name is Aaron Shaw. I work here at CG, and I've I've been uh, fortunate enough to hear you speak a number of times. And every time I come away, I'm impressed, and every time I learn something. And tonight, I found myself thinking. I, I agree with everything you said. I agree that the internet's ubiquitous. I agree that it's touched everyone's lives in a profound way. That it's an engine of economic growth, the likes of which the world's quite possibly never known. And I also agree that it's under tremendous threat, and that those threats are at the political level, and that they're almost tectonic in some. And so with threats that are that big and that profound, my question is what can, can everyday Joes like me do if I agree with you on everything else, that it's so important, that we want to preserve it, that we want to preserve the freedom and openness that's made, that, that, that's made the, the internet, the, the hallmarks of the internet, what do we do as regular people given the threats that are at play? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have seen a lot of examples of civic engagement that has had direct impacts on how internet governance unfolds. And I think because we've seen some examples of those that there's a great potential for a greater civic involvement. Um, in being involved in, dis in online discussions can help with agenda setting and um, having voices be heard. It can be influential. Um, t t just, just two quick examples. There was the massive online boycott over a bill in the United States that would have changed the way the domain name system works. That's just the mapping between names and numbers online. And internet engineers said that, well, this bill, which was designed to protect copyright, would have broken the domain name system. It's a much more complicated story than that. But it led to a massive online boycott uh, that, and also some um, an opportunity for citizens to sign petitions and millions of citizens got involved. And so it went from what looked like in the United States House and Senate as a completely done deal to a legislative effort that was derailed. It was also, private industry was involved in that too, so I don't want to say that it was just civic engagement. There were um, nonprofit organizations that led citizens, but that was an example of where 
uh, we can make a difference. I think on net neutrality, that's another example where citizen engagement can help influence uh, policymakers. That what is net neutrality? It's just the basic question of whether it should be legally prohibited for an internet service provider to discriminate against certain kinds of content over other content. And that's a big debate right now in North America, in the European Union, and elsewhere. So getting in, in educated about the issues and communicating with policymakers, and to a certain extent, even trying to become involved in internet governance itself, whether through things like the internet governance forum and speaking about it, or being involved in online fora, or <clears throat> you know, keeping um, abreast of some of the standard setting institutions and what they do. So there are lots of opportunities to plug in. I do think that um, that is only one you know, civic engagement is only, can only go so far, though. I think that private companies um, are doing some things to push back against governments, and in turn, governments are pushing back against some things that are happening with private companies that are also changing the nature of the Internet. So I always like to say that our best case scenario is having a balance of powers uh, between those kinds of forces. But thank you for that question. And how about this side? Hi, my name is Fatime. I'm a UBC graduate who lives in Waterloo. Um, my question is about how jurisdiction works right now and how it might be changing. So you mentioned that um, right now plaintiffs are pushing for ownership over probably the .ir um, domain name to collect revenues um, for compensation from the Iranian government. Um, who they found were responsible for Hamas terrorist attacks. Um, how would that work if, say, an Iranian court or an El Salvadorian or Nicaraguan court found the United States liable for um, like a US-backed militia terrorist attack that happened on their citizens? How does the, um, the system work right now where which governments and which court systems do they respect their rulings and which ones really have no say? Right. That, that's a very interesting question. And the truth is that neither one of those lawsuits is going to go anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, but it does raise the question of uh, it, what it does is it adds to this sense that no one government should have control over an institution like ICANN. Right? It, no one government should have control over an institution like ICANN. And it should be so-called multi-stakeholder and not multilateral either. That's not the solution. But this jurisdiction question is a really complicated one in cyberspace. Because think about a transaction on the internet. You have where you're physically located, but you might be accessing a server that is located in the Cayman Islands. But the uh, resolution of the name into the number, the registry who does the translation might be located in Brazil. And the company that you're accessing might be incorporated in the United Kingdom. You see what I'm saying? So it is a complete mess about jurisdiction. What normally ends up happening is that a company of, you know, let's use Google as an example, as the, the largest information intermediary, they have to. Um, they are legally required in where they do business to meet the local laws of that place. So in, in some places there are laws where um, you, it's illegal to insult a monarch or where it's illegal to say certain things online or do certain things online or to be openly um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender online. That it's, it raises huge, huge questions for the company because sometimes they, they acquiesce to the local cultures and the local jurisdictions, and in general, companies do. But in other cases, they actually push back against it. So I can't even say that it's just that you meet the uh, legal obligations in a particular country. If you look at the transparency reports that companies like Twitter and Google and other kinds of information, information intermediaries have on their sites, you see that there's a huge disconnect between the number of, I'll just give you an example, the number of requests to turn over personal information about people, and then the number of requests that they actually comply with. So that gap between what governments are requesting and what they actually do is, that's where the power is, right there. So it's not just that they comply in every jurisdiction, um, they do it, it, they do comply with a lot of laws, like the, having to deal with privacy laws in certain cases. But what often ends up happening 
is that there are clashes of values where if you comply with one law in one jurisdiction, you're actually violating the rights of someone who exists somewhere else, like this right to be forgotten law in the European Union, where, one, as I always say, one person's privacy right is another person's censorship when you demand something to be taken down from the web, but it's on my website, or, it's on, or I'm a journalist, and my article gets taken down because I talk about someone. So, um, boy, did I not answer your question. It's a complicated mess, so thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Eric Jardine. I work at CG as well. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk tonight, Laura. It was very enlightening, as always. Uh, my question, actually building off the right to be forgotten point that you just mentioned, has to do with this, uh, what happens when the fundamental and underlying technological structure of the internet clashes with the rights that we are trying to protect. And the right, the right to be forgotten is an interesting example because there you can have media articles so forth removed from the internet, but it's only removed from certain search engines and so forth. So the underlying structure of the internet seems to trump our efforts to protect rights. I was wondering, does the technology always prevail, do you think? Or can we actually enforce rights, even if it is at variance with the technological structure of the system? I would say that technology doesn't always prevail. That, that, that's my answer, because um, there are people in between the technology and the laws that can make things happen and can change the nature of the technology. It's very important to remember that technology is not fixed, it's constantly changing. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if you have this in Canada, you know, that game whack-a-mole, right? Something emerges somewhere and you deal with that, something emerges uh, somewhere else. So uh, I, I think just the nature of your question is one of the great open questions about the direction of the internet is uh, you know, what's going to happen to the technical architecture as governments increasingly get involved in things that to the technology looks like censorship, it looks like breaking the internet, because the technology doesn't know what the content is necessarily. It just knows that it wants to get a packet from point A to point B. And when you start to have all of these filtering systems that make the internet look different in one jurisdiction from another jurisdiction, it creates a great deal of complexity that the technology has trouble dealing with. So um, I, I would just add that to the list of concerns about what's happening right now. Do we have another question here? Oh, why don't I take one online and then we'll go right to you. So wait right there. Um, there are a couple, I'm, I'm looking at an online question right now and I'll just read it. Given the strong and increasing role of the private sector in internet governance, what do you think the internet will look like in five years? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that five years is considered a long period of time in internet years? I just want to say that that's, that question has a lot of brilliance embedded in it. Brian from Toronto, very nice. Um, it used to be that you would say in 20 years, and maybe about five years ago you would say, what will the internet look like in 10 years? But now it's five years. I think, um, you know, if, if you look back at the history of the internet, it started out as not private and then the privatization started happening in the 1990s and has just increased over time and increased over time. And I think that uh, the, the private sector-led internet governance model is going to uh, prevail for the next five years. I, I, I think that these things, um, if you think about um, ICANN in particular and the move to to change what that kind of governance looks like, I have to say that it's actually been since 1998 that this has been discussed. It's been in the media for the last year, but the, the question of how to transition away from the US government, for example, has been going on and on. It's, there's a certain conservative momentum around that. And it's the same thing with the private sector, because when you start looking at the infrastructure, you see that the private sector owns the telecommunication facilities, fiber optic cables, twisted pair cable, satellites to some extent, switches, internet exchange points. A lot of this infrastructure in most of the world is operated by the private sector and I believe that will continue to be the case. I also think that the, um, the role of these information intermediaries will continue to have a great deal of momentum, like search engines, uh, making decisions about how to rank information through their algorithms. So um, I think what's gonna happen is that the internet in five years, because of this, will look um, pretty much like it is right now with the exception of 
new episodes of Orange is the New Black coming out. We'll have some new episodes and we'll have more of the Internet of Things. So we'll have more things connected. But thank you very much for that question. Let's take this one. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Tim Lembete. I'm a visiting scholar at the Balsili School. I'm from South Africa. Um, one of the things that struck me in, in your talk is how a lot of the challenge to internet governance as it currently stands is coming from so-called emerging powers. So the ones you mentioned, Brazil, India, um, China. Um, and that's part of a broader shift in global Power. But the thing about those kinds of shifts is that they're inherently unstable, or rather they cause some kind of instability. So what I wanted to know is what your thoughts are about how a country like Brazil, let's say, would be able to gain more power in internet, in internet governance, um, and yet the stability of the internet being with the stability of the internet being maintained. So are those two goals consistent? Um, Will a country like Brazil be able to get some of the power that it wants um, and internet stability be maintained? Thanks. Right. I, th that, that's a very good point. Um, a country like Brazil has actually been fairly advanced in the internet governance arena. They, and they just passed a set of laws called the Marco Seville laws that provide a lot of rights in cyberspace. Um, India has been advanced in certain areas and, and not in others. So I would say that these, um, <clears throat> these countries, especially when it comes to dealing with information flows within their own borders, are doing a pretty good job of uh, managing things, including privacy, including free speech, including how to deal with defamation, reputational issues. They're providing incentives for technological growth. And part of the reason they're doing that is because they see that the internet is the engine for economic growth in their, in their countries. So they have a complete economic incentive to help to foster a stable and free internet in those societies. So I see that as a positive force for the future of the internet, especially because um, most of the growth, in population growth and usage of the internet will come from emerging markets in the coming years. So I don't see that as coming into conflict with internet stability at, at all. And then on the, the, if you move a little bit further and you just look at countries with terribly repressive uh, policies towards information, like um, like the Irans and the Chinas of the world, um, increasingly Russia, they already have their act together in terms of repressing information flows and very extensive systems of filtering and uh, uh, blocking. So we have that happening. We have um, the, you know the the U.S. Uh, internet governance environment and the history of the U.S. being involved in these institutions. And I think that emerging markets and how those governments deal with the internet can be a stabilizing force over time. How about on this side? Yeah, um, my name is Ed Waters. I live in Waterloo. I have a very simple question. Uh, looks to me that the internet created quite a few uh, monopolies. Quite a few what? I'm sorry. Monopolies. Mm -hmm. uh, Icon is one of them. Uh, all the top level the country domain names registries is uh, monopoly. Uh, Google is almost a monopoly. Uh, is anything being done to uh, eliminate the monopolies? If not, uh, maybe uh, you can tell me how I can uh, get one. I would like to operate a monopoly. <laughs> okay. Point well taken. The reason that there are dominant institutions of internet governance like ICANN and like even the regional internet registries, like these uh, top-level domain registries that run those, is it, it stems from a technical decision that was made a long time ago about the requirement for globally unique names and numbers. And it didn't at all have to be that way. There could have been numbers that were um, assigned randomly over time. There were other ways to do it. There were other ways to do it. But that was the technical decision that was made for engineering reasons, and that's why there has to be this oversight. I would actually argue that we need to have a stable, somewhat, and if, if you knew me at all, you'd understand how painful it is for me to say this, but there has to be some centralized control of the names and numbers because of that requirement. Because what would happen if we had different kinds of domain name systems 
that would be that would take the internet and break it into different segments. So that's why there's so much attention to the institution of ICANN and why that needs to be truly multi-stakeholder so that it's not a monopoly, so that it involves the, uh, the interests that have a stake in the outcome of the various decisions and as well as the input of different governments. So I don't know if we can, can we call it a monopoly if we find a way to accurately reflect the interests of those um, involved. We probably can call it a monopoly, but it would be at least one that reflects the interests of the various stakeholders. On the other part of your question on the private monopolies, well, it, if you look at the global environment, there are search engines that <clears throat> you know, have more users than Google, um, parts of Google around the world, whether Baidu in China or other, other ones. But, um, but we do have dominant uh, companies. I know from the history of the internet, though, that what we view as monopolies in one era are no longer monopolies over time, so things constantly change. I, my students like to tell me that Facebook is a monopoly that will be around for forever, and I just don't accept that. I think that the next generation isn't going to want to be on a social media platform with their parents, <laughs> and that, that's why we no longer have MySpace, and Friendster, and that there'll be another thing that the new generation uses. The search engine, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, there's, that has a network effects aspect to it where it's uh, probably going to be more entrenched as the dominant platform for a long time. But thank you very much for that hard question. And the online question here is, wh okay, why, do, these are all tough questions. Why do you think governments are so concerned about creating laws to restrict information transmission through the internet? Uh, Juan Rojas from Colombia. Thank you, Juan, for that question, if you're listening. Well, I think I'll give that one answer. There are a couple of different answers, but one answer is the fact that f forces of power can no longer control things through traditional laws and through dealing with individuals. The best example of that is intellectual property rights. It used to be the case that you could sue individuals and stop them from, violate, from, from piracy. But what happened is you get these stories about, uh, about companies suing, uh, this is a real case, a young woman who was in the hospital with pancreatic cancer being sued and getting letters, cease and desist. It turned out that she, it wasn't her that was downloading the pirate, pirated videos. Not effective, it's not effective to go after an individual anymore. It's also no longer effective to go after content because if you take down individual content, it just emerges somewhere else. So what's happening instead are forces, whether governments trying to control the flow of ideas in their environment or corporations trying to control the flow of the monetization of ideas through intellectual property rights are realizing that, well, the, here's one thing that we can do. We can go to internet infrastructure and instead of dealing with specific content, or specific people, we could take down the whole website, and that's exactly what happens. So even in the United States, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency of uh, the Department of Homeland Security can go to the domain name system, which simply resolves a name into a number, takes you to a website. So let's say you, wanted, you were going to a website like... Um, I'm just going to make up one, louisvuittonknockoffs.com to buy something that's um, a, tra a, a counterfeit good. Or you go to a pharmaceutical site that sells illegal uh, pharmaceutical drugs or something that, down that has pirated movies or music. You can go to the domain name system and you can take down the entire website. So I think the reason that governments are um, interested in laws that involve the internet and the transmission structure around the internet are because it's no longer possible because of the leakiness of information, and because of the low cost of digital technologies, it's no longer possible to stop ideas and to stop um, also illegal activity without doing that. So that's one answer, Juan, and thank you for the question. Would anyone else like to ask a question? I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two more. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was very interested in the idea of fragmentation that you brought up. Um, and 
I'm sorry, I should say I'm Sasha, and I'm a recent graduate of the War Studies Program at the Royal Military College of Canada. So I'm coming and looking from an a, a intelligence and security perspective. Um, and I think of recent uh, stories like um, China using social media to gather intelligence on Western countries, or stories like uh, academic institutions, I can't remember the university off the top of my head, but the Dark Web Project, I'm sure you've heard of it, um, where they used systems to examine social media and, and public sites um, across various languages to look at and target legitimate terrorist threats and be able to see those or see trends within them. Um, so how would the idea of fragmentation, if we went to that, affect the ability of either offensive or defensive intelligence gathering, or would it at all? There are different kinds of fragmentation, and I think almost every kind of fragmentation would affect intelligence. I really do, because there's one form of fragmentation that carves out unique infrastructures within the predominant infrastructure that can be used for clandestine um, communications between you know, any manner of nefarious activities or terrorists. So when you have that kind of um, f virtual fragmentation that can make it more difficult for um, intelligence gathering related to national security. So that's the case. When you look at other kinds of fragmentation like infrastructure, um, at the infrastructure level, that prevents um, you know, the whole idea of fragmentation is to prevent surveillance. And so you could argue that there are good forms of fragmentation in certain environments and, you know, make it, make it more expensive to have massive surveillance of citizens, for example, but also for routine, necessary national security type surveillance that's targeted, that kind of fragmentation would make it impossible to surveil people. So I think that every, every kind of uh, fragmentation is um, could impact the issue that you brought up and I really haven't heard many people bring up that issue so I want to thank you very much for bringing it up okay well, why don't we take one more question and then we'll call it a wrap uh, hi I'm Isaac I'm currently a student um, my question uh, is in reference to fragmentation and also trying to enforce norms, no matter uh, liberal or conservative to the right or the left in nature, we see that as soon as someone tries to enforce a norm, then fragmentation, there's, there's a group of people that, regardless of the nature of the rules, want to avoid them, um, either it being a repressive government trying to avoid them or someone trying to avoid a repressive government themselves. Um, how do we deal with the adverse effects of uh, trying to enforce norms? Trying to enforce norms. Well, let me say that as concerned as I am about fragmentation, I also recognize that we want certain kinds of fragmentation. Like there are certain norms that would create a need for fragmentation. So you could argue that um, I, we don't want to have a universal internet around accessing your, you know, your personal financial transactions, right? You're interested in having really tight encryption, really closed networks. Uh, there are entire industrial sectors that require closed networks in order to do their work. Um, industrial systems are an example of that. Energy systems. You kind of want fragmentation around that. So I don't want to give the idea that fragmentation is always bad. When you look at the public sphere of the internet, that's where for the purposes of access to knowledge and freedom of expression, you generally want to have the ability to have universal access to information and the ability to speak and be heard in any sphere. Now, so r around the norms question, I would say that it, you know, if you're just looking at the public sphere aspect of that, how do you enforce norms? I don't think you can enforce norms. I, I think it's all wrapped up. I'm thinking I, I would r refer you to uh, Larry Lessig's argument in Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace about the things that can influence change. And there are four things. Does anyone know the four things that can enact change in cyberspace? Markets. That's a very powerful force. Laws. Cultural norms is one of them because cultural norms, if you're someone who studies video games, you know about the cultural norms being the all-powerful thing within those systems, but also that code is something that's very powerful. So if you were going to look at how norms affect cyberspace, you would have to do it in the context of it being interrelated with those other four things. So that's actually a great way to close because what I focus on in that is primarily the code part of it. 
and how code is increasingly determining uh, what our internet freedom is going to be and therefore our freedom is going to be in the future. So thank you very much for that question and the other questions and for listening and thank you very much for having me here tonight. Well, a few quick comments before we adjourn. First of all, thank you, Laura, for your uh, very interesting lecture this evening. This is exactly how we want the CG lecture series to go with informed experts uh, helping us to understand important international issues. Uh, you promised to walk us through the intersection of the technical side of the internet and global politics. Well, what an intersection. I see now that the lines aren't clearly painted, the lights aren't working, and everyone has a vehicle in there. Um, we all take this for granted, our rights and our freedoms online, but as we see tonight, there's so much at stake in the uh, global war for control of the internet. And if we want to uh, protect our rights, obviously we've got to have a voice and we can only do that if we're more informed. And so helping us to be more informed, thank you very much once again. The edited video of tonight's uh, lecture will be posted to the CG website and I also want to point out that if you want to learn more about the global commission that CG is helping to run that Laura is doing the research, leading the research for, you can find out about it at ourinternet.org. And our next public event in the CG Auditorium is coming up quickly on Monday, September 15th. We have Professor Abdullahi and Naeem from Emory University, and he'll be here to discuss the complex relationship between uh, Sharia law and is is Islamic law and human rights. And then on Tuesday, September 23rd, the CG Cinema series begins a new season with a screening of We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks. This documentary tells the story of the organization's birth and its most high-profile leaks, and it builds on the themes that Laura was talking about tonight. So be sure to register online for the CG Events newsletter to learn about these and other upcoming events. Thanks for coming to CG tonight, and have a safe journey home. <laughs>